Anyway, let's, uh, let's pray one more time, shall we? Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, it is so good to come into your house of worship today and to worship you. And Father in heaven, I just pray, as you've heard Brother John speak, that you will anoint my lips, that the words that are spoken will truly glorify and magnify who you are, and that you've called us, You've called this church, you've called this denomination to proclaim the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ to a world that is in its final chapters. And I pray, Father in heaven, as well, on more of a special note, that you'll please just be with Sean and Megan today as they're giving their sermon down in Lapine, and that you'll bless their lips as well. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name, amen. As a dad, it always makes you happy when you, you, uh, you hear your son and your daughter say, you know what, I think I could give a sermon. It's like, oh Lord, please do the calling. Please do the calling. It is so good to be uh, worshiping with you all today. I hope you had a really good week. I don't know what that is coming up. Let me uh, see if we can change this a little bit here. Does that look better? Okay. I'm getting used to a new PowerPoint program, so it looks a little bit different for me. Um, we, got, we are going to be covering, and as we have been covering, uh, portions of Revelation. We're working through that book of Revelation, and uh, we're in chapter 2. We're getting into some of the history of the churches, and specifically we're going to talk about the first church, the Church of Ephesus today. I uh, just want to encourage you as well, on Wednesday night, we're going through Daniel. Now you're sitting back here maybe going, what's up with all this prophecy stuff? What are we talking about? You know, church, I, I believe we are living in different times. And we have been saying that for a while now, but the Lord is coming very soon. And we need to be really getting into and understanding and studying prophecy like we haven't understood before and studied before. And um, we want to, as leadership in this church, provide that opportunity for each and every one of us to get in and study the scriptures. And uh, to, to crack open those pages and, and to maybe dust off the bookshelves of uh, the prophecy going into the 2300 days. And not just knowing about it, but knowing how to, to, to get into it and to study it. And so, Wednesday nights, we are doing that. We're getting into it. We have uh, two more chapters of narrative uh, before we get into the, the Daniel 7, where we start getting into some prophecy. And it's important that we set that ground rule up of getting into those narratives, because it develops the sovereignty of God. And so please come out for that Wednesday night, 6.30, uh, right here. I can still remember it, and maybe if you can, uh, you will too. I walked out of the classroom, I had the keys in my hand, and I had an instructor beside me, and we were heading off to this blue Ford Tempo. And uh, I was going to get into this car with this man, and he was going to critique my driving. I waited my whole life for this. All 15 years at that point. I wanted to drive so bad I could not wait to get in the car. And sure enough, I got in there, turned it on. I was excited. And I heard my instructor by the name of Mr. McGeehan. He said, all right, Jonathan, head out of the parking lot and go make your first right turn. All right, no problem. I've been practicing a lot, so I drive out of the parking lot, and I'm going driving down the street, and I noticed that, you know, the old position of 10 and 2, my hands were getting tighter and tighter on the steering wheel. You ever, you ever have that? And then, especially since he said, okay, now I want you to make this left and right and left and right, and I, I knew where we were heading. We were heading to the highway. And I was nervous. I always got nervous on the highway. 
And so I'm, I'm in there, and I'm praying, Lord, you got to help me. And so I get on the on-ramp, and I'm starting to take off, and sure enough, I'm driving. I've merged on, everything's okay, blinkers were on, blinkers were off. <sighs> he's he's kind of quiet, so we're okay. And I'm driving along, and, and he says, um, at about halfway down the trip, or halfway through the trip, he says, what does that sign say up there? And I was like, what sign? <laughs> he says, that, that green sign, what is that saying up there? I was like, you mean I got to take my eyes off the road to look at the sign? He says, look up. Oh, I tell you what, I didn't know, but I was staring like five feet in front of the car the whole time, making sure that the car stayed in the lane and it wasn't going back and forth. And, and he says, look up, look up. So I looked up, and then it was like, oh, I'm out of my comfort zone, but I could see a different picture. I could see a completely different picture while driving. I want you to turn in the book to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, we're looking at this church, a letter to this church entitled Ephesus. Revelation chapter 2. Now as we're, as we're kind of journeying through here, I want to give you a little history on this, this city known as Ephesus. It wasn't a real good city to be in. In fact, it was a, it was a pretty downright nasty city to be in. Um, they had all different kinds of stuff going on there. But one of them was it was one of the largest kingdoms in the Roman Empire at that time. This population was well over 250,000 people. Very, very big. It was known for its famous port. And they had to constantly uh, dredge the port out because silt kept coming in. Huge trade uh, city that was going on in there. And one of the major trading items they would sell is uh, the statues of Artemis. And so uh, very, very prosperous. It was also known for being a city of entertainment and theaters. In fact, one of the largest theaters that we have recorded, let me see if I can do this here. Did that pop up okay? All right, this is a drawing of it. When I was in Turkey and I went to Ephesus, I actually walked into this, this theater. It was huge. It would, it would seat 50,000 people. It was a ginormous theater. And they would have anything from entertainment type of stuff to, um, you know, like, uh, acting and plays and that type of thing uh, to, to other uh, more of a gladiator type of stuff but it wasn't, it wasn't like the arenas okay I'll give you another picture of it here you can start to look at just the, the sheer enormity of it they would cut it out in the actual rock face so you would sit in there and you're actually sitting on rocks it has weathered it has stood the test of time uh, and pretty impressive. In fact, I don't know if you can see right smack dab. It's kind of blurry, but there's a man standing up in there. It is a big theater. And the acoustics. Now, this is an outdoor theater. The acoustics in here were amazing. You could stand below at the very bottom, and you could just talk about this loud, and everybody within the theater could hear you. It was just simply amazing. It was amazing. And I wanted to throw this in here just for... Those who don't like using porta pots, how do you like their public restrooms? <laughs> yeah, they had running water that would go in there, and you'd all kind of join in, and uh, there was no male, female. You just kind of all went in there to, together and would use your holes in a rock. So, yeah, yeah, fascinating, fascinating place. I mean, Ephesus was the epitome of of uh, idol worship. In fact, one of their big idols that they worshipped, I had mentioned before, was Artemis. She was known as the goddess of fertility. And it's interesting, when you walk through Ephesus and you walk down those streets, there's not one of her statues still up. They're all gone. You'd have to go into museums to see them. But they had... Um, Images was she was standing there and she has like bumps all over her. And I don't know, this may be too graphic. Maybe I shouldn't say it. Um, but since she's the goddess of fertility, I'll let you kind of put those two things together. 
Okay. Um, she, there was also, um, as being the goddess of fertility, she was also in charge of or controlling uh, magic. And magic we see very heavily involved in, in astrology, very heavily involved in Ephesus as well. Uh, the Romans maintained her image of Artemis, but they called her Diana. And so they would worship Diana as well. There was another major uh, uh, religious push within this uh, city of Ephesus. It was emperor, emperor cult. And the emperor cult was worshiping the emperor. And with worshiping the emperor, you would get special benefits. You'd get these statues that would come out. You'd get special theater uh, plays. You'd have all these special things that would take place. And so they would have a group of people that would come in there and would worship and adore the emperor and receive the gifts of the emperor for the, the, the city of Ephesus. As well as Gnosticism was starting to come up. And we'll get a little bit more into that as the, the sermon goes on. But Gnosticism itself was a religious movement that stressed a superior philosophy. Um, it was likely to be present in the marketplace. So you would have people that would come around and, and they would proclaim their wisdom and uh, we had a big push, I think it was like four years ago, on this thing entitled The Secret. You ever see, remember seeing those books? It was entitled The Secret. Anyway, it had like a seal on it, and it was a secret, and the only way you can open and unlock that secret, secret is to open up your mind to the wisdom and philosophies that they had to offer. Well, Gnosticism itself was, was definitely strong. It was viewed as a gift of salvation from above, joining the knower and the deity together. It's almost like a God within movement. Um, again, with Artemis or Diana being there, you had magic. Magic was very uh, prevalent in this area, especially among the poor and uneducated. Philo was making comments on this, and he said that in the Hellenistic thought, magic was the belief and a spirit world influenced virtually every aspect of their life. He said the spirit world was, it was engaged in their life. And then he goes on to say that Ephesus was known as a place of demonic activity. Very fascinating. So Ephesus was not a real good place to say, hey, let's plant a church. You are surrounded by the clutches of the devil. So let's take a look here. And um, we'll take a look at Ephi or the uh, letter to the, the Ephesus church. It's in Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false, and you have persevere, or perseverance, and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen, and repent. And do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. It's really important as we've read through this letter that it was a specific letter for a specific church. And this church had specific issues. And they were going through those issues and John the Revelator was writing this letter to them to describe and to to lay out what those issues were issues were. Okay, therefore, 
What we have to also understand is this. When we're reading through the book of, of Revelation, we've talked about this before, that it is a book of prophecy. So not only was this letter a literal letter that was dealing with a specific time in a specific church, but it can also be viewed as a, a time frame of history where the church, the Christian era, or the church and go operating through history and what was taking place within that church, okay? And since we're dealing with the book of prophecy, we can also understand that these churches are dealing with a, a symptom of what individual churches are going through in today's present time. Now, how do we get to that point? Why can I say those three things? Well, look back over in Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated or signified it by his angel to his bondservant, uh, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus, even to all that had saw it. So again, this book was written of things that were soon going to take place in that text. Okay? Let's take a look at another one in verse 19, 19 of the same chapter, chapter 1. 19 says this, Therefore write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these. So again, we're looking at present, past, and future. We can understand that whole principle when we pull back the letters and you can see, oh, sure enough, this church was going through it. Also, this letter was cycled through the series of seven churches that were around there. Okay? All the churches read this specific letter. They all knew what was going on. So... If we take this and we understand that these, lever, uh, these letters can cover a broader sense of time and history, then, for example, we can look at the church of Ephesus as being the apostolic era of the first century. What was going on in the, in the first century church as they're first starting off? They're going through growth pains. They're going through experiencing what it means. They've just left the Jewish faith, the Jewish community. They've, they've just now are, are seeing new converts coming in and the growing pains that are taking place with that. Or the next church, the church of Smyrna, is known as the persecution era or the second and third centuries that was taking place where people were being executed and killed for their faith. Uh, were, were being uh, led to um, the slaughter in, in gladiator pits and lions for just pure pleasure. And then you have Pergamum, the letter to the uh, Pergamum, which means it's the church of compromise. And we look at through church history and the times of history that in the 4th or 5th centuries, that's exactly what we've seen, is a compromising that has taken place within Christianity during that time. And then a letter to Thyatira, we see that as the, the church of the Middle Ages. And we know what was going on within the Middle Ages as, as the Catholic Church, the Dark Ages, as the Catholic Church was gaining more and more strength and power until it met its uh, uh, mortal wound in 1798. And then the, the letter to Sardis is dealing with the time of the Reformation and the post-Reformation uh, era. We find that to happen through the 15th and 18th centuries where, where great awakenings were starting to get, take place, where, where there was a pull back into the Word of God, where their studying became really, really important. And then we come to the Church of Philadelphia, the Church of Missionary Movements that happened from the 18th century to the 19th century, where the church began to broaden its horizons, going past just the local setting, but going out and reaching all over the world and spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then this last church that we have, the Laodicean church, is the church at the present time until the end. 
We see these letters passing through all these histories, all these specific issues. And so now we're going to take a look at, though, what this letter meant to the Ephesus church. So let's go back to verse 1. Let's go back to verse 1 of chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. Now first off, to the angel of the church. What does that mean? The word angel is angelos in Greek, and it means messenger. And so basically, John was writing this letter to the messenger of the church of Ephesus. So if you're breaking that down, who would be the messenger of the church of Ephesus? But the local pastor. So John was writing to the pastor, this is the letter that you are going to be delivering to your congregation. And then he defines the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this. So what is that meaning? We don't have to go far for a clear interpretation of this. What do the seven stars mean? Look at verse 20 of chapter 1. As for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Who are the angels of the seven churches? But the pastors of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Revelation is so great, it will interpret itself nine times out of ten. We don't have to go back to the Old Testament for that one. Okay? So, we see Jesus in this verse as one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, or the seven churches. He's walking amidst them, in the midst of them. Okay. This is really an important point as we start to go through here and develop that. In verse 2, we'll go on, we'll go on, we'll deal with that in a second. In verse 2, it says this, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men. Now we've already told you a little bit what was going on in Ephesus. They had all different kinds of evils that was in there. They were up and down. They were fighting left and right with trying to maintain their purity. Okay, and that's what this text was going on. Uh, you put to test, continuing in verse 2, you put to test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. These evil men. We see a description specifically on who these evil men are in verse 6 of the same chapter, uh, chapter. Verse 6 says this, Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So, this group of Nicolaitans, this group of evil men, uh, is said to be established by Nicholas, one of the seven deacons, that were chosen in the book of Acts. He was a proselyte out of Antioch, and in fact, you can read a little bit more about him in Acts chapter 6, 3 through 6, and I can read that for you real quick. It says this, But select from among you, brethren, seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word, and, and the statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, <coughs> and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these, they were brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. What was so devastating and so damaging about these people, this group, was that they came from inside the own church. He was one of them. He understood what it meant to follow Jesus. He understood what the, the, the concept was of salvation, and yet something happened. It twisted, and he began to pull in this wisdom, philosophy type of background 
that was going on and, and causing people to be led astray. Their core belief was that Christianity, which was established, was based and founded off of philosophy in and of itself. They focused on releasing, releasing the material, the body, from the Spirit to allow the Spirit to ascend into heaven. Wisdom and knowledge are the Savior of mankind and not Jesus. So an apostasy truly took place. Imagine going through that within your own church body. Where you've grown up together, you've, you've studied together, you found Jesus together, and all of a sudden a split takes place. And you have one group that leaves and the other group that stays. And you have a group that is focused on the love of Jesus Christ and following the Savior wherever he goes. And the other group does not. But the constant battle between popularity and polling between, come over here, experience this, come over here, watch this. That's what was going on in the church during this time. In verse 3, it says they've lost their first love. <clears throat> what kind of love is it that they lost? There's three types of love that is mentioned within the Greek. Stor or storgeo, which is the family devotion type of love. Phileo, which is a friendship love. We get that from the, the word Philadelphia. The city of brotherly love. It's a friendship type of love. And then you come to the last, but definitely not least, the agapao, uh, agapao love, which is the loving kindness. This love is so special and so wonderful that it is a word that speaks of compassion, regard, and kindness that only God can give. So when we, are, when we are going through and we're saying that we need to love one another, we are asking that we have the love, the agape love that only God can give us. And he's saying you need to turn back to that first love. You need to find that love. It doesn't take us that, uh, that long to be able to go back and understand the first time that you met Jesus Christ. Do you remember that day? It was the most amazing time in my life when I met Jesus for the first time. It wasn't so much even a feeling that took over as it was just that reassuring confidence that I have met my Savior and that it's going to be okay. That I was once lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. That is what I found. That is that whole aspect of first love. And then begun, began the studies. Oh, I wanted to share it. I had to let other people know what this first love was all about. I had to let people know this is what it means to be a Christian. And as you walk through and you go through your life and you find that you meet people and they don't think the same way you think, and they don't read the same way you think or you read. And, and, and they don't understand the same way you understand. That then you become more of defenders of your faith. As opposed of just preaching the gospel. And so then you get into the whole apologetics aspect. Where you're defending it. No, listen. The Sabbath is on the seventh day of the week. It says so in the Bible. And you keep defending it, and you keep doing it, and you're focusing on it. You keep defending it, you keep defending it, you keep defending it, you keep defending it, until so guess what? You lose your first love. And Jesus was having this conversation to these people saying, you have done an amazing job defending your faith. But in the process of defending your faith, you've lost your first love. You've lost me. You don't know who you're fighting for. You don't even know anymore why you're doing it. So then he says in verse 5, Therefore remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. Or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. I kind of look at it this way. 
when, when you're out on a trail, and I know there's hikers in here, the church of Ephesus was really focused walking down this trail and looking at all the rocks. They wanted to make sure they could put their feet and step over top of the rocks, not trip over the ruts, right? And they just kept walking and they kept marching. They kept doing all what they had to do in order not to trip and not to fall. They needed to stay pure to where they were at. But Jesus then steps in and says, listen, you've done such an amazing job of making sure your identity is steadfast in the doctrines that you've lost something. You've lost me. So what you need to do is pick your head up. Pick your head up. Look at the trail that's out in front of you. You're going to see the ruts. You're going to see the rocks. You're also going to see the beauty that I have for you. Find your first love. Find that. It's a critical point. Because the church of Ephesus was doing the right thing. You know, when we look for the rocks, when we look for the roots, when we, when we try to maintain our purity, God was saying to them, you did an amazing job with that. He commends us to do that. We need to be looking out <clears throat> after what we are standing for, understand and, and maintaining that purity. But we can't get lost in it. Our eyes, our horizon has to be from looking down to looking up. Not five feet in front of the car as we're driving along. We need to get the big picture. We need to see Jesus. We need to see how he's moving and how he's walking. And that is where this church of Ephesus has gone wrong. And so he says to them in verse 5, Remember. The Hebrew word for that is zokar, which means an action. Constant. It's a doing. It's not just a, a simple going back in time and remembering or a recollection, but it's a remember to action. And in this case, he would be saying, remember, Church of Ephesus, pick up your heads and look. Remember. I kind of compare this to our study, what we had Wednesday night, when we had Nebuchadnezzar that was in the form of a beast uh, eating grass. His head was down. As, as the boys were going around and, and doing some work over at John's place, I noticed that he has cows in his pasture in front of the house. Their heads are always down. And they're always eating the grass. And, you know, I have not seen them pick their heads up too much unless something alerts them. Jesus is tell telling Nebuchadnezzar, he's telling this church, pick up your head. And when his head was raised up, his reason returned to him. His reason returned. He's telling the church of Ephesus, pick up your head and look up so that your reason, your motivation will return to you. Because everything you're doing is right except this. And if you don't have me, you don't have anything. The, this whole concept is established in this form of repentance. So what does it mean to repent? The simple understanding or definition of repentance is if we are walking in this direction and this is leading us towards harm's way to repent means to turn and no longer walk in that direction but walk in the ways of light walk in the ways that are good and upright Ezekiel chapter 18 why don't you turn with me there Ezekiel at, uh, chapter 18 talks about this even more clearly Ezekiel 18, and we are looking at, oh, we are looking at verse 23. Ezekiel 18, verse 23. The Bible reads, Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Declares the Lord God, rather than that he should turn from his ways and live. Repentance means to turn. I'll give you another example of that in the verse 
30 of the same chapter, it says, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, each according to his conduct, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn away. It's acknowledged that I am a sinner. And here's the thing. This is where salvation comes into play. Acknowledging I'm a sinner, moving in the wrong direction. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. But we keep moving in this direction. It's not repentance. Repentance is saying, I'm a sinner. I need to turn and move this way. And look what happens. So that iniquity may not become a stumbling block to you. Notice the ruts in the road. In this case, the lack of love for Jesus Christ. Cast away from you all your transgressions which you have committed, and make yourself a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. Therefore repent and live. So repentance is vital. And Jesus is telling this church of Ephesus to turn and repent from where they're moving. Because the path that they are leading, even though it is founded on good principles, they will die. Look at what he says here. Back in Revelation chapter 2. And do the deeds you did at first. What were the deeds you did at first? You fell in love with me and you followed me. You walked my path. You, you, you did what I asked. We get a big picture of what this looks like. Acts chapter 2. Remember Acts? This early church that has just been formed. Let's take a look. Got to go back. Let's flip through the pages. Go back to Acts chapter 2. I love this. This, this church that is formed right here is an amazing church. But something took place. Something happened. Acts chapter 2. Look at what the deeds they were doing beforehand. Verse 42. Acts 2, 4, or 2, 4. Acts 2, 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings. Okay. And to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They were continually focused on teaching. So they were looking at the doctrines. They were saying, this is important. This is who we are. But look what else they were doing. They were in fellowship with one another. Everybody was together. They were breaking of bread and prayer. Now that could be interpreted as the Lord's Supper. That could also be interpreted that they were going from home to home breaking bread and eating. But they were the, the big picture behind this is, is that they were together through this. Look at what it says in verse 43. Everyone, as a result of them doing these deeds, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders. And signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their properties and their possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continually with one mind in the temple. One mind. There was no division that was taking place. There was no Gnostics in this church. There was no magic in this church. They were one-minded together. <clears throat> Uh, uh, and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Jesus was the source of why they were doing what they were doing. And they were passionate about it. They, they didn't look at it as a single individuals going out and doing stuff. They looked at it as an entire congregation moving forward. An entire congregation saying, I'm lifting up this torch, I'm lifting up this banner, and we are going to conquer the world for the Lord. It was a powerful picture that was painted. A powerful demonstration of what God was doing. But somehow, some way, and we know how it is, life begins to happen. The devil doesn't come in like a bowl in a china shop, it comes in slow and steady. Just gradually throwing some things in there. Let's get brother so-and-so angry at brother so-and-so. 
Now let's, let's start throwing different sides at each other. Boom. Okay, now let's start throwing some different theology their way. Boom. Now we'll really get them. Let's just turn it all upside down so they forget their identity. And they just become defenders of doctrine. Losing their source of power, Jesus Christ. And before you know it, you have the church of Ephesus. You have the church of Ephesus. And look what happens. And it is probably one of the most powerful, powerful demonstrations of what God has a zero tolerance mentality for. If they don't repent and do the deeds they did before, look at what he says. In verse 5 it says, Or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Now remember, where was Jesus walking in the very beginning? In the midst of the lampstands. This is sanctuary talk. This is, he's, this is sanctuary where is the lampstand that Jesus is walking through? The holy place. Look at what's going on here. In Revelations chapter 4, verse 6. Let this kind of sink in because this is pretty powerful. Revelations chapter 4, verse 6. It says this. Actually, we're going to start in verse 5. Verse 5, excuse me. Out from the throne comes flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. Before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. God is saying this. If we do not, Church of Ephesus... If we do not do the deeds, if we have not fallen in love with Jesus Christ, he will remove our church, Ephesus. He will remove our church from his presence. So you have no power whatsoever. I don't know. If, if I was the messenger, if I was the messenger giving that message, I would be trembling up front. Because this church was the apostolic church. This was the church that was coming in and full of life and newness of life and understood the, the, the doctrines of Jesus Christ, understood who Jesus was and who he is. You had people sitting in the pews of this church. If they called them pews back then. Chairs, ground, whatever. They were there as first-hand witnesses of what Jesus had done. And they lost that first love. It's so easy. It is so easy for us to stare at the, rock, the rocks and the ruts in the road. It is too easy. And the devil knows that. The hardest part is for us to keep our heads up and keep looking out. Looking out. Yep, I'm walking the trail. I see there's ruts in the road. I'm going to plan ahead, but I'm going to keep looking out. I want to enjoy the beauty of what God has. I don't want the church to rehab its influence within the community that God has established to be removed because we've lost our first love. That's the message of the church of Ephesus. That is a powerful message. It is a message that you can see goes all the way through to all the different churches as well as through time. We may have all had different experiences this way. We may have gone into churches that are one-sided one way or another. We may have been partakers, which I know a lot of us have been, where there was one belief and another belief, and as a result, there was a splitting away. It's relevant, and it's happening. It's happening all throughout Christendom. God is preparing his church and the church that grows and the church that is healthy and the church that is nourishing other people are the ones that are focused on Christ without losing who they are you know it's that whole adage you can be grace focused or you can be law focused and I said no you got to be both focused if you don't have both you don't have any because it's Jesus who's the foundation of that law. 
is Jesus who is the author and the finisher of our faith. He has to be the central core of this. If he's not, we said the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. If he's not in the center of this prophecy, we have no power, we have no light. It's like in Mark chapter 4. You can write this one down and go and look at it at home. Mark chapter 4, 21 through 24. Or Luke chapter 8, 16 and through 18. It's the same type of principle. I'll read that one for you. Now, no one after lighting a lamp covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand in order that those who come in may see the light. For nothing is hidden that shall not become evident, nor anything secret that shall not be known and come to light. Therefore take care how you listen, for whoever has, to him shall more be given. What a promise to have. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he shall have, or even what he thinks he has shall be taken away from him. The lamp will be removed. There's no light if Jesus is not in our hearts. And that's this message to Ephesus. It's a powerful message that we got to grab a hold of, especially with the, de the, the deceptions of what Satan has been doing in this world today. Because friends, you and I both know, we are going to be going through some times that can't even be uttered with words. If we are not grounded in the word of truth, if we don't know who we are and the God whom we serve is not Lord and Savior of our life, we are in trouble. I'd like to carry it a little bit farther. Is that the church of Ephesus can be your own individual self too. And how your walk and journey is with the Lord. Is it a walk and journey where your head is down and focusing on all the problems and defending all the problems? Or is it looking up and going to the source of where your strength is at, and that is in Jesus Christ, to work through those problems? Recognizing they're going to be there, but being able to walk over top of them without stumbling because Jesus is leading the way. That is his call to the church of Ephesus. That is his call to this church, and that is the call of our individual connections with Jesus Christ to each and every one of us. He says, don't. Don't just stare at the rocks, but look up at me. The rocks are going to trip you, but I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to help you get your feet over top of each and one of those barriers. It's me, church. It's me, it's what I did for you upon the cross. And the reward is great. Look at the last verse in this. Verse 7. It says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This tree motif... Here we see this tree back compared in Genesis chapter 2 9 to the tree of life, which is in the midst of paradise. Starting there before sin entered, and then we see it again in Revelation chapter 22, 2 and 14, at the end, where it's restored. Friends, I'm telling you, we really need to, and this is speaking from my heart. Being a Christian is not for the faint of heart. It's something that you are empowered to go through. It's something that is probably one of the most difficult things that our individual walk and journey will be and do is being a Christian. You know, I remember when I was a younger kid and I'd walk in and we'd we'd go to the swimming pools that were above ground and we'd have all the kids in there run around in one direction and just run around and run around in one direction right around the sides of the pool 
And then right at the last minute, we'd go, all right, turn around and go. And so we'd turn around, and the current would be pushing us back. Being a Christian with present truth is like pushing against the currents. It's easy, friends, when you hit resistance to fight for a little bit, but then just to turn and let the current take you away. God is calling us to something so much bigger and so much stronger. And our eyes have to be lifted to the source of power in order to get through it. The moment that we think we have the answers, we're going with the current. We need to be having our connection with Jesus Christ and the study of his word, not just mere talk from up here. Some of the toughest men in the world couldn't come close to comparing what Jesus went through. Not even closest. My best friend I had in the army. There's a book that's out in uh, Barnes and Nobles right now. It's America's Tough Guys. They're pretty tough. In fact, I think he's number four on the list. Amazingly tough guy. He bows his head before the Lord because he realizes where his strength comes from. There's nobody tougher than Jesus Christ. And we need to have him on our side. And with him, what can go wrong? What can go wrong? We will be able to sit in the paradise eating that fresh fruit, whatever it will be, off that tree of life. And remembering back to that time, if we can, of when it was tough. When we're having to walk over those obstacles and barriers. When we're having to, to really watch what's going on. When we're going to sit back and say it was all worth it. It was all worth it. Jesus is coming soon. You sitting in a Seventh-day Adventist church believes that. Our name pronounces that. We believe in the second advent of Jesus Christ, and we know he's coming soon. I think I mentioned it before. And I, I, it's one of these things that I'll keep saying until maybe somebody will come back and say it to me. But just as in the days of Noah, they were marrying and giving in marriage. The only way we're going to truly understand what sin looks like is in the Word. That's it. And I think that if we aren't in this, and we're just going through life, the second coming is going to take us off guard. You know, it's kind of like some of my loved ones who say, well, when it gets close, we'll know the signs of the times, the mark of the beast, and all this type of stuff. You know what? You're already deceived. That's too late. Our only source of security in, in and understanding is out of the Word of God. That is what's going to clarify what we're, the time that we're living in. These people during Noah's days, they were marrying. They were having parties. While this big boat is being built. Really? Rain? Are you kidding me? I mean, think about how illogical that was in a time frame where there was no rain whatsoever on the planet. Now compare that to what the message is that Jesus is coming again. Really? When, and he's coming out of the clouds? That's ridiculous. Think about the time frame. And he's going to catch us off guard unless we turn to our first love. Turn to our first love. Get into the word. Have your time in prayer. Don't be afraid. I know some people are afraid to pray because they don't know how to pray. You know what? It was, kind of like, it was kind of like I was at school, going over just a little bit. And there was, a, there was a young man out there, and he was trying to hit the ball. And all the kids are trying to help him. Oh, no, your stance, you got to be like this. You know, bend your knees, put your arms up, pull the bat back, look, do this. And, and he couldn't hit the ball. He couldn't hit it. I was like, how do, how do I help this kid out? I can, tell, I can tell he's frustrated because he wants to hit the ball. 
And then it hit me. I, I truly believe it was an answered prayer because I was, I was praying for him. I knew he wanted to hit this ball. And I said this, you know what? Forget all that stuff. Just hit the ball. And he looked at me and said, just, just hit the ball. <laughs> Boom! Triple play. Or triple, or ran three bases. He just hit the ball. Let's not make it overcomplicated. Get in and read it. Spend time talking with Jesus. He's your first love. Spend time with him. Talk to him. Last night I had to go for a walk. It was too beautiful. I wanted to walk where it was, the sun was going down. And I just sat there. I had people walking by. And I'm talking, Lord, what an awesome night. This is so amazing. They probably thought I was crazy, but I don't care. I was talking to my creator. It's having a conversation with Jesus. Because he's worth it. He's worth it. That's what he's calling us to. And you know what, church? We will. There's a place at the table for every one of us there. And we will be able to eat of that tree of life. I'm anxious to be there. I'm anxious to see every one of us there. Every one of us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just thank you so very much for your word. And I thank you, Lord, for loving us so much that you don't just let things go, but you bring them to our attention so that we can make that change. For how fair would that be for us if we continue to do what was wrong or put our attentions on what is not right when it was your will and your way that we've been missing? So, Father in heaven, I thank you and I praise your holy name. Now give us the strength, we pray, to endure, to walk through, to spend time just cherishing that one-on-one -on -one with you, being able to open up the word and realize that we're having an audience chamber session with you and to have that time and conversational prayer with you. Lord Jesus, what an amazing thing you have given to us. We're not like Artemis. or we're, We don't worship a God like Artemis who is nothing but a stone who doesn't respond, but we are worshiping the Creator. And we are just so thankful that you're a God who stoops low to our concerns, our cries, all those uh, issues that we have in life that you're there ready to take them from us. And so, Father, as we prepare to leave this time of worship, May this message of Ephesus ring into our individual hearts. May we seek you first and allow the greater picture to take place. We love you and praise you. And we thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen.